right, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you all had a great weekend. Um, so before we get started, are there any questions about anything? Um, the homework from last week, happy to answer any questions about that. Um, happy to answer any questions about the homework from this week, uh, which is not due this week, it's due next week. So I've got two weeks for this homework. Um, certainly, you know, if you want to submit it early, you can. You don't have to. So it should be posted. You should be able to see it. Um, apart from that, though, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, certainly, if you have any questions throughout the lecture, feel free to ask. I'm happy to answer anything. Um, but today, we're going to be talking about the many-to-many -many relationship. So if you think back to the modeling chapters, we talked about this relationship a little bit, and we talked about how we address it. But we're going to go into more detail today about the specific relationship. And this is a very important relationship because it's something that occurs many, many times inside of data models, yet we don't want to just leave it as is and assume it's going to be good enough. So uh, with that out of the way, um, take a look at this quote here. It says, fearful concentration of circumstances. Uh, or no, that says fearful concatenation of circumstances. That makes a lot more sense. So uh, that's the quote of the chapter. Um, kind of make it that whatever you will. The very first slide, though, is a very old Walmart receipt. Anyone remember Walmart receipts looking like this? So if you're anything like me, the first thing I did when I saw this is I scanned through it to find any embarrassing items. And I didn't find any. Uh, but I thought it might be uh, kind of funny. So certainly, you know, this is uh, an example of what could be a many-to-many -many relationship. We're buying many items, and many items may have different prices, you know, lots of different things going on here. So we'll talk about how we address that. Um, and, you know, at the basic level, this receipt right here is output from our system. So when we have output, we call that a report. So this is a specific report for a specific customer. And then we have a form. This is how we input information into a database most of the time. So those are the two distinctions there, is that we input into form, we output into reports. So this is just an example of a sales form where basically you're inputting what was sold. So you have your item number, the description of what the item is, uh, the quantity that was sold of that particular item, what the unit price was, and then unit price times quantity gives you the total. You add all those up, that gives you the grand total. Uh, who can see some issues with this? Any issues at all we could address with this? So the biggest issue is the description. Um, you don't really need to type the description every single time. Um, here, that'd be quite uh, problematic. Imagine if you sold... Um, I don't know, let's say you're a sporting goods store and someone purchases a football. Do you want to describe a football every time? It'd be very time consuming. It's just a football, you know, basic pig skin, I guess. So you probably don't want to bother to do that. Additionally, if you have the item number, you also have the unit price. So you shouldn't have to input both of those. Um, you know, if we have the item number, we should know how much it costs. So that's certainly some other information we could probably remove. Um, so yeah, you wouldn't need all that information on a sales form. Now the exception could be you could change the unit price based on the quantity purchased, but we don't have that information. So certainly we want to think in that way when we're talking about databases. We'll talk more about normalization in the coming chapters. But that's kind of what we're trying to do is we're trying to eliminate that redundancy. So getting back on topic a little bit here, um, we're going to talk about the many-to-many -many relationship. And of course the many-to-many -many relationship says that we have many uh, instances of a relationship both ways. So if we had students registering for a class, we'd have many students registering for a class, and we would have class being registered for by many students. That's a many-to-many -many relationship. So basically, that's going to be a big problem for us. A couple of reasons for that. The main problem is we can't uniquely identify each instance of the relationship because we have two minis on each side, basically, or maybe three or more. But certainly we have at least two identifiers that we cannot identify. So we address this by using an associative entity. All we have to do for an associative entity, just form a new entity, remove the many-to-many -many relationship, go ahead and make relationship by the two or more entities that previously comprised the many-to-many, -many, and just add in the primary keys for each of the different um, entities that are involved in the associative entity. 
So in this case right here, we have sale and we have item. So if we want to get line item, of course, we could do a couple different things here. We could take sale number and item number. And of course, they're also having line number here. But if we didn't want to have line number, we could simply use the primary key sale number and item number to comprise the associative entity of line item. So that's all we have to do here. Um, now what they're doing is they're actually using a weak, weak entity here where they're making sure that you can only identify it with a sale. So it's really up to you how you go about it. I personally think it's better practice to use the uh, primary keys from all the entities involved. But if you wanted to make a unique uh, entity for some or you know some portion of them, you can. So you have that freedom there. Um, like I said, it's going to be a lot easier for you to not and to just use the primary keys from all the entities involved, but you can uh, do however you want to. So uh, basically, you know, we're just talking about how we actually go about storing the data. So that's all we have to do. Just create an associative entity. Uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, certainly, that's the main uh, concept of the chapter, but it's not the only concept of the chapter. So when we're talking about we apply this to a relational model. Uh, we're not changing any major rules. You know, certainly. We have our current rules for making sure we don't have any redundant information, making sure we don't have any information that if we delete something we lose, we don't have any insert anomalies, nothing like that. We're not changing anything. So uh, basically all we're doing is we're just creating a new entity and assigning the primary keys from all the entities involved. So the book says two, doesn't have to be two. Um, you could certainly have a three or four way associative entity and that's perfectly okay. So uh, I think back to earlier in the semester where we had the example where we were actually having the airplane lease and we had the hangar and all that information. It all formed a single associative entity. Certainly something you could do. Um, of course, as we know, when we take the primary keys and we put them into another table, which is the associative entity table, they're going to be foreign keys. So that goes without saying. You can choose whether or not you want to apply a constraint to them, but they will be a foreign key. Now, of course, some main reasons you would not want to apply a constraint. Uh, at some point, you have to input whatever your information is. So you have to input it first into one entity or one table. And, you know, so you can't have a constraint both ways, basically. So imagine I had a table called person and I had a table called, let's say, student. So for whatever reason, I had those two tables inside of a database. I couldn't have a foreign key on person ID for both of them where I have the constraint configured because then I'm not able to input that information. I can't simultaneously input information. It has to be done first in one, then the other. So it's pretty much what we're talking about. Uh, so let's take a quick look at this SQL code here. Um, if you're having trouble seeing it, I do apologize. I bolded it and made it a little bit bigger, uh, but it's still uh, a little bit small. So basically we just have create table sale. We have our various sale attributes here, sale number, sale date and sale text. So we're just defining those. Um, as you can see here, sale number is going to be the primary key, but we also have sale date as uh, not null. So it's certainly something we can do. We can specify anything we want to to not be null. Uh, then of course we have the item table. So we're just uh, defining our entities there, setting the primary key to item number. And then lastly, this is the only thing we're really adding. It's just we're adding in a new table for line item. So basically, like I say, um, we're just going to set the sale number and line number. Those are both going to be the primary key. And of course, we're going to apply constraints. So whatever we have, we have to make sure we're inputting it first into our sale table and into our item table before we input it into the line item table because of these constraint statements. So if we get rid of these constraint statements, we can input the data in whichever order we please. Um, does that make sense to everybody? Any questions about that so far? So again, it's pretty straightforward here. Uh, we've done this sort of thing. So um, now, of course, we're going to add in a little bit more complicated, but not too complicated. So if you think back to uh, last class, or maybe the class before, uh, we did a two-table join, where we took one table, we joined it with another. I believe we did this with the nation and stock table. So all we're doing today is we're just adding in a third table to join. So basically, we're just going to do like we did last time, where we do select whatever we want to select, from the first table, we do join second table. We define what it's going to join on. So in this case, we're using sale.sale number. Of course, a primary key from the sale table. 
equals line item, which is the second table that we're joining, uh, dot cell number. That is, of course, the uh, foreign key inside of the line item table. And then we're not quite done yet like we were before. We're just going to add in another join statement. So then we're going to join the item table onto uh, the item dot item number equals line item dot item number. So basically all we're doing there is we're just kind of using that associative entity to associate two entities together, uh, if I can use that terminology. So that's certainly uh, pretty straightforward. So again, we just take the first join statement as we did before. Once we've done that, we just add on that second join statement. Any questions? All right. So now we're going to talk about how we actually apply this to running queries. So we've established how we would actually go about it. Let's take a quick look at this three table join. So what we're going to do here is we're going to list the names of items, quantity, and value of items sold. So right off the bat, you know, we're going to have our select statement. We're going to get the name of item, this item name, uh, the quantity, just going to be the line quantity. Then we're going to get the value of items. It's the line price. So we're just establishing all those inside of the select statement. And we're also going to get the total of the sale, line quantity times line price is total. So we're just casting that value as we're calling it total. Of course, we're getting this from the sale table, but we're going to do a join, actually two joins. So first we're going to join to line item. So we do from sale join line item. Of course, we're establishing line item dot sale now equals sale dot sale now. Uh, then we're doing another join right after that. Join item on item dot item number equals line item dot item number. And in this case, uh, we're adding in a where condition because we're only interested in items that were sold on January 16th, 2011. So all we have to do there is just put in the where sale date equals whatever the sale date is. Now, when you do this, make sure that you're matching up your uh, whatever data you have. So in this case, it's stored, it appears as though year, day, month, or year, month, day, rather. Now, just make sure you have that correct. You can cast it if you need to. So if you needed to define it, you certainly can. Uh, but it's probably easier just to go ahead and match whatever your uh, data type is. So any questions about this join? Again, you know, when in doubt, just keep adding on join statements. Um, that may not actually be the best advice, but it should work most of the time. So here's where it gets a little bit more complicated, uh, but not that much more complicated. So now we're not just interested in getting everything. We want to only get stuff that exists in two different places. So basically what we have is we have the exist modifier. And this allows us to test whether or not a particular value is within inside of a particular table. So basically we can set this. So we're going to start off by selecting the information we're interested in, item name, item color. So we want to get the item name and the item color within inside the item table. So we just do from item. Now, of course, we're going to do where item type equals C because we're interested in uh, clothing items for type C. I'm not sure what type C is. Doesn't really matter. We just specify type C. Um, and then we only want to have it where a sale is recorded. So we may have a million different clothing types of uh, item type C. Again, I have no clue what C is, but we may have a million. And we only want to get ones that have sold. So we may only have 100,000 clothing types that actually have a sale, one or more sales associated with them. That's where this exist clause comes in. So then uh, we're inside the where. Then we do and exist. We also want to make sure that we have a sale recorded for it. Select star from line item. And of course, we can just leave that as star because it's not actually going to return that information. It's only going to see if the record is present. Uh, where line item dot item number equals item dot item number. So again, we're just doing that join. And we're not necessarily explicitly defining it, we're implicitly defining the join statement there. We're defining the line item, the item number is equal to the item, the item number. So we're just seeing whether or not those records exist. And because we're setting exist, it's going to return the ones that do. So of the clothing type item C, we have hat, uh, polar explorer. We've had at least one sale of that. We've had uh, snake proof boots, it looks like. Uh, pretty popular item in certain uh, climates, I guess. Uh, the pith helmet and the Stetson. So those are the particular clothing type items of type C that have at least one sale report. And of course we get the sale by whether or not it matches inside of the line item table. So 
Any questions about this? All right, let's see another example here. So in this case, we're going to select the item name and the item color from the item table, uh, kind of like we did last time. And yeah, so basically this is the same thing we just did, where we're just uh, matching them up. So we're selecting star. I mean, the main thing here is that we add in the and exist condition. So when we add that in, it allows us to tell whether or not it exists. And if it doesn't exist, it's not going to report it back to us. Now, in some cases, we may want the opposite of this. We may be interested more in whatever items we have that aren't selling. So if we want to do that, guess how we do it? That's exactly correct. Uh, Maxwell, that's right. Yeah, so Maxwell is exactly correct. If we want to get the items that do not exist within the table that we're interested in, we just use the modifier not in front of exist. So there's really not a major difference here. Um, that's pretty much all we have to do. Pretty straightforward. So this is what it would look like. And of course, as you can see here, this time it's going to return the opposite. It's going to return the ones that did not sell. So we have lots of different items. Some of them sold, some of them did not sell. So this is just going to be, give us the ones that did not do not have a sale associated with them. All right, let's take a quick look at this. Um, report all brown items that have been sold. So let's take a stab at this. So right off the bat, we're going to start off with a select statement. You can say something like select maybe item name, comma, item color. Um, it's certainly something we could do. Where are we getting that from? So exactly, so it's going to be from item. And what are we going to set for the where if we want the brown items? So exactly, so it's going to be where item color equals brown. We're going to make sure we put brown inside of quotes. Um, then what else do we need to do next? So how will we do that exactly? Yeah, so that's exactly correct. So we're just doing where item dot item number equals line item dot item number, closing off the parentheses there and putting a semicolon on the end. And I do apologize. Somehow or another, I got muted inside the team. So what do I need to repeat? I'm not sure how long I was muted for. So let me know what I need to repeat, and I'm happy to do so. For those of you face to face, I apologize. And for those of you in Teams, I also apologize. So yeah, basically, if we wanted to do uh, brown items that have not been sold, we just do the exact inverse, basically. So we would just do, instead of saying and exist, we just say and not exist. Um, so let's see, the statement needed. So I'll just go over the statement again briefly. Uh, all we're doing is we're just reporting the brown items that have been sold. So first we select the item name, comma, item color from the item table, uh, where item color equals open parentheses, brown, close parentheses, and exist, open parentheses, select star from line item, where item dot item number equals line item dot item number. And if we want to do the inverse, we just throw in the not exist. So we just put on the not modifier there. We'll be in a really good spot. Um, let me know if there's any questions. I'm certainly happy to address them. All right, now here's where it gets uh, quite a bit more complicated. Uh, we're going to apply the divide modifier. Now, I'll go ahead and uh, give the disclaimer. This will not be on the exam. Um, divide is pretty complicated, and it doesn't really bias anything we can't do in other ways. 
So basically what this allows us to do is to see uh, using almost like we're using for all. If you've taken a couple of programming classes, you've probably come across a for all loop. That's basically what this is. So uh, we don't really have the for all modifier though. So instead we use nested statements to accomplish this. And basically we do not exist several different times. So what we're trying to do is if we're wanting to find all items that have appeared in all sales. So we're saying that if there's a sale transaction for every sale transaction we have, this item was always sold. Now that's not inherently the most useful thing ever because if you have a million transactions, what are the chances there's an item in common in all million? I'd say it's near zero. Um, you know, there could be some exceptions if you have a particular charge you apply for every single transaction. But even then, you're going to waive it in some cases if you have a million of them, I can only imagine. So that's what we're doing here. So we're just saying find items such that there does not exist a uh, sale where the item is not present. So we're just going to use several different nested not exist statements. So we're trying to see items that have appeared in all sales. So we want to get the item name from the item table where not exist select star from sale. Then we're doing another one where not exist select star from line item where line item equals item uh, equals dot item number equals item dot item number and line item dot sale number equals sale dot sale number. So basically we're just seeing for every single record that we have, what do we have that is inside of all of them? So it's a little bit confusing here because we're using kind of a double negative uh, where we have the not exist. So again, it's not going to be on the exam. It's not going to be on the homework or anything, but it could be important to be exposed to it if you ever wanted to do this. Um, can anyone think of a realistic example where we'd have something that's present inside of every single record? If we have a substantial amount of records, that is. Yeah, I'm drawing a blank as well. You know, if we had that situation, would we need to have the information stored at all? We probably would not. Um, so certainly if we had a million records that are the same exact thing, what's the point? You know, we could certainly uh, derive that information in more compact and you know less resource intensive ways. So that's what we're doing here, though. Uh, if we wanted to do something where they appear in all sources, this is kind of how we go about it. We just select what we want to select. So we're saying does target one appear in every single instance here? Um, we're doing our we're not exist select star from source uh, we're not exist target source so we're just saying does target one appear in every single instance of these two uh, tables so again this is unlikely but this is how we would do it so if we want to see this uh, here's just another example here we're gonna go ahead and skip it here's stuff that is uh, likely to be pretty useful so two main modifier tips uh, I believe chapter eight or nine, we're going to cover some relational algebra, and that is extremely applicable. This is kind of like, uh, how should I put this? It's like a good intro to the relational algebra, where we're going to start off with having the union statement, which is basically like saying if something is inside of this uh, category or this condition, or it's inside of this condition, it'll return it. Then we can also do the intersect, which is like saying, if it's inside of both this first condition and the second condition, then we'll return it. If it's not present inside of both those conditions, we won't return it. So it's a lot easier to implement. Let's see how we do that. So first we're going to start with union. So basically we're saying items that were sold on this particular date or brown items. So all we have to do is just set up our first part of that, which is items sold on this particular date. Select the item name from the item table. Join line item on item dot item number equals line item dot item number. Uh, then of course we're getting our second join statement there, which can be join sale on line item dot sale no equals sale dot sale no. Then we're adding in our where sale date equals 2011-01-16. And again, it's just arbitrary date that's given inside the problem. 
Now we're going to do or, so we say union and SQL. Sorry about that, guys. And then we're going to add in our second select statement for the other or condition. So in this case, we're going to get or or brown. So we're just going to select item name from the item table where item color equals brown. Close that off with our good friend the semicolon. And we've just compiled that. So basically, inside of this uh, table we got output, we know that these are either items that were sold on the 20 uh, on the 16th of January 2011, or they're items that are brown. So those are the two options here. It's either one of those. If you want to see items that were sold on that date and are brown, we just instead of having the union right there, we're going to do the same thing, and we're going to use the intersect. So these are going to be items that are both of our two conditions. And we're not have to be limited by two conditions. We could certainly have three, four, an infinite amount of conditions. If we want to do items that are brown or uh, blue. We could certainly do that as well. Now we wouldn't have to use another. Uh, wouldn't have to use another union. We could. We could also, of course, use the uh, regex and just do the um, or option inside of the regular expression. So certainly have lots of different ways to go about doing these queries. But as you can see here. We're wanting the and, so we just use the intersect option. So that's the only difference here. Um, again, the main takeaway from this chapter is just doing kind of nested um, join statements where we want to join more than two tables at a time. So just kind of wrap things up. We covered the many to many relationship in a good bit more detail than we have. Talked about how we address it. The main thing is just to make an associative entity. It's always best practice to just make sure we get the primary keys from each of the tables that are involved swap them into our associative entity. That's really all I have to do there. We talked about the exist modifier. We covered the divide modifier a little bit. Uh, we're not going to use the divide too much. And we also covered some basic relational algebra. Uh, any questions about today? Certainly, I'm happy to answer any questions. If not, I hope you all have a great day.